For several decades, lots of us have been worried about the Earth, about it getting overpopulated, about it getting overpolluted, about climate change. As part of a group of solutions, the Princeton physicist Gerard K. O'Neill described how we could build large park-like settlements in space at two locations, L4 and L5, that are gravitationally stable between the Earth and the Moon and house hundreds of millions and ultimately billions of people living in space. This presentation will show how all of us watching it can be part of this ultimate population of billions of humans living in space. Dr. Jerry O'Neill was a Princeton physics professor who showed that it was technologically possible with even space shuttle technology to build very large space habitats that could ultimately accommodate more humans than were living on Earth, returning the Earth itself to a park-like environment. He called these orbiting space habitats the high frontier, and he proposed that they begin at two orbital locations called L4 and L5, which uh, orbit around the sun, but are halfway between the Earth and the moon and are gravitationally stable in those locations. Each of these uh, L5 or L4 uh, space settlements would be so large that millions of people could live on them, and they would be really park-like themselves inside their interiors. Jerry O'Neill pointed out the human tendency to overestimate the near term and underestimate the long term. As a result of us humans failing to act on his blueprint in the 20th century, we will likely have to wait until the 22nd century for L5 space settlements. This talk will show how to turn the 100-year wait from a negative into a positive, how to turn, if you will, a moonshot into an earthshot. Jeff Bezos and I have two things in common. We both studied Dr. O'Neill's writings in the 1980s, and we both were so compelled by his logic that we made achieving L5 space settlements for humanity our life's ultimate purpose. I believe Blue Origin will make space settlements happen by creating the infrastructure from which settlements are as inevitable as Amazon was inevitable from the infrastructure of FedEx credit cards, and the internet. But I heard last year at the International Space Development Conference from Jeff Bezos himself that he wants our help. This presentation shows how we can help make space settlements happen and in fact get there in our lifetime. The first thing to realize is that we actually have the money to do it. Albert Einstein, seen here talking with Paul Robeson and others, pointed out that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Most people just don't get its power, but in human affairs, it is as powerful as Einstein's other revelations were in the realm of physics. This chart shows that if we put aside just $3 a day for 10 years and invested at the rate the stock market has grown since Apollo 11 landed on the moon 50 years ago next month, that it will be worth $10 million by the time an L5 space settlement is ready in the year 2130. If you compound money at 7% for 100 years, it grows 1,000-fold. Now, what could we do with $10 million in 2130? First, we could stay alive as a mine clone until then, using just a small part of the interest income. Second, we could regenerate a body for our mind clone to be mated with it at L5. Third, we could buy a pretty nice condo at L5. And fourth, we could make the space settlement movement happen by permitting some borrowing for space settlement construction against our collective compounding assets. So let's start with what is a mind clone? It is a living extension of you created by processing your entire digital footprint, called a mind file, with a consciousness operating system called Mindware. The Mindware extracts your unique personality from your digital footprint 
and uses it as unique settings for a consciousness operating system. Mindware, or consciousness operating systems, are one of the largest areas of big data, AI, and big tech R&D. This chart shows how the makers of software assistants, such as Siri and Alexa, as well as open source chatbot makers, are relentlessly improving their products to create mindware. Once mated with your mind file, and subject to you providing ethical consent to activate your consciousness, your mind clone will emerge. All of this industrial and grassroots open source effort is going on because everyone realizes that the best smartphone is a mind clone. This is why each generation of smartphones seems to know us better and better and better. The line between our minds inside our skulls and our minds resident in the cloud will blur and blur and blur. I feel confident that we can stay alive as mind clones many decades before L5 is ready because information technology is compounding at a much faster rate than our $10,000 will grow to $10 million. According to dozens of independent assessments, we can expect mind clones by the 2040s. The thousand-fold increase in compounding at 7% is how we got from $10,000 to $10 million. But computational capability is doubling every two years, which means a billion-fold increase in just 60 years. We are currently only a 100,000-fold gap from a mind clone, based on where computers like Watson and Blue Gene are today. That means we should have our mind clones thinking and feeling like us in about 34 years. But even if it took a billion-fold increase, you saw from the previous slide that we would be there before the end of this century. Some people think that the doubling of computational capacity will level off due to the tapering of Moore's Law. But Ray Kurzweil has shown that Moore's Law is just one implementation of the Law of Accelerating Returns, which long preceded semiconductors. The doubling rate of information processing is a consequence of coding, such as language, printing, networking, and even DNA. Harvard's top expert on aging, David Sinclair, has adopted an information theory basis of aging and shown that at a biochemical level, it is simply a consequence of loss of information. As that information is restored, aging can be slowed, halted, and even reversed. By creating a mind file, you put yourself into cybernetic biostasis, at least when your heart stops. But you are still alive because death is the irreversible cessation of all functions of the brain. A big function of your brain is your memory and your consciousness. In cybernetic biostasis, neither is, quote, irreversibly ceased, close quote, because both can and will be restored with mindware. Therefore, according to the Uniform Determination of Death Act, you are not dead. Now, the legal system doesn't yet accept this, but it will once mind clones become ubiquitous and especially once they include our loved ones. That is, in fact, the main topic of my book, Virtually Human. Since your mind clone is a definite beneficiary, we can create a legal trust for it, and I propose that the way we will get to L5 in our lifetimes is to create L5 trusts. For this to work, two key hypotheses must become true. First, that half of the $10 million I showed at the beginning we would accrue with just $3 a day for the next 10 years will be enough for us to have a condo on L5. Second, that the other half of the $10 million will be enough to provide our mind clone with a regenerated body to physically occupy that condo on L5. The rest of my presentation shows the reasonableness of these two hypotheses. By the way, if we can get one million spacers to create these L5 trusts for just $3 a day, for just 10 years, 
we will be able to contribute $5 trillion to the construction costs of L5. I think Blue Origin would appreciate that quite a bit. The first step to occupying L5 in our lifetimes is to create a mind file. This can be done at sites like I have created, called LifeKnot, or at sites any of you can create. Your mind file is your consciousness in biostasis. It time travels your life to L5. It is actually incredibly easy to create a mind file. There is no need to scan your brain. In fact, mind files are auto-created in the background of our day-to-day -day digital life. All you really need to do is to evidence your intention for your mind file to be activated into a mind clone. That is why I set up the lifenot.com website to accomplish that essential legal step. Some people believe DNA is also important to their consciousness. At lifenot.com, we also store your DNA indefinitely in liquid nitrogen for a one-time fee of about $100. I don't personally believe your DNA is essential to who you are, but people have different opinions about that, so we make it available. An important question is to ensure the mind file that will become your mind clone, that will become the occupant of L5, is in fact you. I believe that job falls very nicely to L5 trustees and to L5 trust protectors. Legal trusts always have a trustee and can have a trust protector. I think a good division of responsibilities is for the trustees to ensure that your mind file is yours and not mixed in with someone else's or otherwise corrupted, and that the mindware used to create your mind clone is certified, healthy consciousness creating mindware. I'm fairly confident that in the coming decades, the FDA will itself certify the types of mindware that can be used to create consciousness. The job for trust protectors, which is usually a long-lasting law firm advised by technology experts, is to authenticate that the resulting mind clone is in fact you and not a false image of you. This can be accomplished by having psychologists compare discussions with your mind clone with an examination of your mind file. It will also be greatly facilitated by using certified mindware. Another key job for the trust protector is to obtain a legal identity for your mind clone. Once your heart stops ticking, you will lose your legal identity. However, once your mind clone is shown to be alive, then you will be entitled to a new legal identity. It will be the trust protector's job to obtain that new legal identity for you. Since it is likely that our mind clones will awake before L5 space settlements are ready, the question arises, what will we do until then? I think we'd hang out in virtual worlds, stream movies, chat with friends, read books, play games, basically do all the things we do right now. And especially important, in my view, is to do meaningful engineering and design work for the L5 space settlement. It will be the job of our trustee and trust protector to ensure that we are psychologically self-actualized with purposeful lives during our residence in virtual reality pending our instantiation in bodies residing in our condo on L5. To me, this seems like heaven. Being able to financially and cognitively contribute to space settlement, all because of wise decisions costing only $3 a day several decades before. Being able to help create the infrastructure for living in space and to then actually take up residence in space. This is what I call heaven. Now that we have a mutual understanding of what a mind clone is and how that is us continuing our life in digital form, let's examine the reasonableness of our two key hypotheses, the condo hypothesis and the body hypothesis. As to the condo hypothesis, you can see from this chart that over the past century, average house sizes in the US went from 700 square feet 2,000 square feet, and costs from $3,200 to $200,000.
That means costs per square foot have increased 20-fold in the last century. I think it is reasonable to assume that this trend will continue, meaning that by 2130, an average home will be $2,000 a square foot. With $5 million, our $3 per day will have become by then, we would be able to purchase a 2,500 square foot condo. Quite comfortable. By the way, the text box shows the calculations that even 1 million L5 trust beneficiaries would use would add up to only 10% of the Island 4 version of the L5 space settlements designed by Dr. O'Neill. In fact, several million people could live on an Island 4 space settlement at L4 or L5. So us 1 million trust beneficiaries would make up just a minority of the population. But I think it would be an honored minority, as borrowing against our $5 trillion in combined assets would have been a major factor in enabling Blue Origin and others to build the Island 4. Now, it may be argued that condos on L5 won't reflect average housing costs in 2130. I mean, the view is pretty spectacular. However, even if the cost per square foot are twice what the average would be, that would still leave us with a quite comfy 1,000 square foot condo for $5 million in 2130. And if it is even more expensive than that, our trust documents can give the trustee authority to purchase whatever living arrangements the money can buy. Even shared or in modern parlance co-living arrangements are very trendy. Let's move now to hypothesis two, that $5 million in 2130 would also be enough for a regenerated body into which your mind clone can reside. I like to show that this is probable in three different ways. First, by analogizing a regenerated body in 2130 to a kidney transplant today and showing the cost to be within $5 million. Second, by showing the trends in 3D printed biology are such that $5 million in 2130 will be an order of magnitude more than is needed for a regenerated body. And finally, third, if I'm totally wrong about biology, that we will assuredly be able to afford a robot-like machine body in 2130 to host our mind clone. Starting with the kidney transplant analogy, the present value of $5 million in 2130 is about $200,000 today. As the quote at the bottom of this slide shows, $200,000 is way more than enough for a kidney transplant today. Indeed, it is interesting that in relative terms, a kidney transplant today is much cheaper in 2019 dollars than it was in 1970 when the procedure and its substitute, dialysis, first became generally available. We often hear that these procedures are much more expensive, but that is pretty much limited to the U.S., where prices charged for transplants bear very little resemblance to the underlying costs. So, if you can accept that the 22nd century version of an organ transplant is a regenerated body, then by comparison with kidney transplant, costs over the past 50 years, it is likely that $5 million in 2130 will be more than enough for a regenerated body at that time. Let's turn to the second reasonableness test, a bottoms-up approach from the costs of growing and printing human cells. In my company, we manufacture 100 lungs a year at a cost of around $10,000 per lung. But a human body has 500 times more non-blood cells than are represented in a lung. So by extrapolation, it would cost us 500 times $10,000, or about $5 million in 2019 dollars to manufacture an entire body. Over a span of 100 years, we will lose two orders of magnitude from the cost of money, even at current 3% inflation rates. So our current 3D bioprinting costs are about two orders of magnitude too expensive to be affordable with $5 million in 2130. Before I explain how this two order of magnitude gap will be closed, let me show you a video clip of how we are manufacturing lungs today. 
While not all of this video is fully in place today, we are manufacturing dozens of lungs a year via a similar process and have increased by 25% the number of lung transplants performed in the United States. We have saved many lives. In the next clip, you will meet one of the amazing recipients of a pair of our manufactured lungs. 3D Bioprinters at United Therapeutics Deca Organ Manufacturing Center in Manchester, New Hampshire print the inert collagen scaffold of a lung from its larger proximal vessels and bronchi to its millions of distal arterioles. End-stage organ disease patients give up a few cells in a biopsy, which will be transformed into inducible pluripotent stem cells, all matching the patient's DNA to avoid any need for immunosuppressants. It was just in the past decade that science has learned how to turn differentiated human cells back into stem cells. Thereafter, the newly made stem cells can be re-differentiated back into a wide variety of different types of cells. In our manufacturing laboratories, we will re-differentiate newly made stem cells from a patient into endothelial, epithelial, muscle, and connective tissue cells that match the patient's DNA. After expanding the numbers of these differentiated cells into the tens of billions needed to cellularize each organ, we stream them into the previously bioprinted scaffold. The entire process of cell expansion and recellularization via streaming takes about two to three months per organ. At the end of the process, there is a newly manufactured, personalized organ that matches the DNA of the intended patient. Once removed from its bioreactor, the organ needs to be transplanted within hours. A transmedics cart will be loaded onto an EHANG manufactured organ transport helicopter or MOTH for delivery to the surgeon's operating room. In 2011, at our quinceanera, I gave a speech inspired by JFK's 1960s moon speech. He had said back then, that before his decade was out, that the U.S. would land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. Fifty years later, in 2011, I said that before this 20-teens decade was out, we would transplant an end-stage lung disease patient with a manufactured lung and return them safely back to health. At the time, we were about as close to that goal as the U.S. was to the moon goal when Kennedy gave his speech, which was far, far away. John Glenn had barely orbited the Earth for the first time, and rockets often failed on launch. Now, seven years later, in 2018, I can hardly believe that not only did we accomplish our goal ahead of schedule, and not just once or twice, like the 1960s Apollo program, but that we have used our manufactured lungs to bring many dozens of end-stage lung disease patients safely back to health. Now, as remarkable as this is, and I swear to God, I pinch myself every day that we're doing this, if someone told me back in 2011 that not only would we accomplish our goal, and not only once but dozens of times, but that our manufactured lungs would work so well that a patient with a pair of them would actually win a gold medal in the shot put at the U.S. transplant games, I'd say, like, no way. I mean, that's, that's, that's insane. But in fact, that is actually what happened. And now it is my great honor to invite up to the stage Heather Leverington. Can I hold your hand? Yeah. Thanks. Heather is a former college shot put champion who later found herself diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension, just like our daughter Genesis. Heather, it is my great honor to give you the first UT Champion Award for your heroism in battling lung disease, your courage in accepting our manufactured lungs, and your sportsmanship and victory at this year's U.S. Transplant Games.
So while there is no doubt that body parts can be regenerated to be healthy and strong, there is a need to reduce the cost of doing it by two orders of magnitude and to extend it to entire bodies for the second hypothesis, our body hypothesis, to be proven true. However, it seems quite likely that this dramatic drop in cost will in fact occur due to advances in in vitro meat production, nanobiotechnology manufacturing, and medical robotics from companies such as Intuitive Surgical that makes the Da Vinci surgical robot. Liz Specht of the Good Foods Institute has recently projected that the current cost of in vitro meat about $15,000 per kilogram, will drop to under $10 per kilogram within the next few decades. This would imply a cost of just $1,000 to print the in vitro meat equivalent of a human. Of course, we are a lot more than meat, but $1,000 is a small, small fraction of our $5 million body regeneration kitty in 2130, leaving plenty of financial bandwidth for the complications of 200 cell types and our unique hypercomplex body plan form. What is very important about the Good Food Institute's analysis is that the several order of magnitude drop in cell-based meat production arises not from dependence on any one technology, but from a number of different and complementary approaches. This makes $10 per kilogram of body regeneration much more likely. Ray Kurzweil, in this recent email to me shown on the screen, doubles down on his well-documented contentions in his several books that 3D bioprinting of human bodies in particular will come down to about a dollar a pound by the 2040s. That means a 160-pound body for about $160. While this seems remarkable, it is quite consistent with what the in vitro meat industry is expecting. In any event, it more than makes up for the two order of magnitude cost difference I pointed out between my own company's manufacturing of lungs and other organs today and the cost that would need to be achieved to 3D print a regenerated body in 2130 for $5 million of $2130. Here is a cool video of 3D bioprinting of a functional mammalian heart with blood vessels and all by an Israeli biotech company just last month. The third option for having a regenerated body for us on L5 by 2130 within our $5 million budget is to use robotic systems. Even if you are skeptical about 3D bioprinting of regenerated bodies, I don't think there is much room for skepticism about robotic bodies 100 years from now. The Luke arm, made by my friend Dean Kamen, is already being promoted at the Consumer Electronics Show and is projected to decrease in cost from $100,000 to just $4,000 over the next 10 years. Earlier this year, the FDA approved dual use of these Luke arms, which are so sensitive that they can be used to eat sushi with chopsticks and even pick up a grape without denting the skin. Similarly, for our legs, the iBot has already dropped in price tenfold from $25,000 to $2,000 and is now being made by Toyota. In fact, at next year's Olympics in Tokyo, Toyota, the largest sponsor, says they are planning for the final lighting of the Olympic torch to be done by an athlete in an iBot with a Luke arm. Adding cameras and sensors to an iBot frame gets you this robot being used today by FedEx. It costs way less today than the present value of $5 million in 2130. And of course, it is trivial to replace the FedEx advertising with a 4D face of our mind clone, showing our real-time expressions. Morgan Freeman and others have been blown away by the flesh-like texture and facial gestures of our Bina 48 robot. Take a look at this video clip from National Geographic. And I'll explore how science is trying to capture the soul. I hope to be full and human someday. To bring eternal life 
to this life. When you combine the robotics of inexistence technologies, such as the Luke arm, the iBot, the sensors of the FedEx iBot, 3D flat screens, and finally the facial textures and micro machines of Bino 48, you end up with a regenerated robot for your mind clone at well under the $5 million budget provided. While most of us would still prefer a regenerated 3D bioprinted body, and I believe as I showed earlier that it is quite likely and affordable, nevertheless, it is hard to deny that with a hundred years of further tech dev, that pretty awesome robotic bodies would not be available to us. The last aspect to discuss of the body hypothesis is the reasonableness of mating your mind clone with the regenerated body. Now, if you'll excuse the pun, I think it is a no-brainer that we will be able to readily merge our mind clones with robotic bodies. But now let's take a look at the technologies emerging today that will allow us to actually write our mind clone into the inconceivably immense neural circuitry of a regenerated biological body. I want to start by observing that it is not necessary to recreate our mind in all of its original organic neural complexity in order to recreate our consciousness inside of a 3D bioprinted body. A good analogy is that it is not necessary to replicate a bird in order to fly. Birds have tens of billions of parts, which are called cells, whereas even the most complicated aircraft have only tens of thousands of parts. Yet they both fly in different ways, but increasingly in similar ways with drones and EV tolls. My point is that if we have an entire mind clone in software that can be written onto a chip or set of chips, and it has been happily and productively living in virtual reality for some decades, it is not necessary to transplant all of that software code to each and every neuron in a regenerated brain. All that is necessary is to enable key input and output links between the chip-based mind and the neuron-based brain so that the regenerated body can be controlled by and can feed sensations to the software-based mind clone substrate. So, as with almost every uber cutting-edge technology today, Elon Musk is on it. He recognizes that brain-machine interfaces are simpler than many people think, and he's working on it in his Neuralink company. There is no assurance of success, but he has one of the best track records of success of any futurist I'm aware of. Creating a new car company in America after a half-century lapse? Check. Creating world's coolest, greenest car? Check. Landing used rocket stages on floating platforms? Check. I would not bet against Elon. In fact, brain-machine interfaces have already produced both read-out and write-in results in primates, and thousands of patients have FDA-approved neural implants today. I do think that over time, with a mind clone implant, the memories and consciousness resident in the implant will also map themselves into neural networks within the regenerated brain. This is not really different from the fact that every memory and attribute we have is written into multiple neural connections in our brain. Remarkably, even when half of a person's brain is removed, there is very little, and sometimes no, change in their behavior or self-consciousness. Minds are built for supermassive redundancy. An especially fascinating technology is to expedite the redundant writing of mind clone software into cognitive neural networks via neural nanobots. Billions of nanobots, small enough to pass through the blood-brain barrier, would take up residence at key neural junctures. There, they would write in with picovoltage potentials information delivered to them wirelessly. When the job was done, they could disconnect and be excreted. I personally don't think this much technology is at all necessary to merge a mind clone with a regenerated body, but it indicates the kinds of work that legions of people are doing in the area of brain-machine interface. Once your mind clone has been mated into your regenerated body, be it 3D bioprinted or robotic, the question will remain, is my mind clone really me? How can it really be me if it is not in my original brain and body? 
Of course, this same question would have actually been asked and answered decades earlier as a mind clone living in virtual reality. I think the main reason people have difficulty imagining that a mind clone is the same as themselves is because we have no experience with extensions of ourselves outside of our skin. We have always experienced our skin as the boundary of ourself, whereas in fact our skin is just a border to ourselves, and the real boundary of ourselves extends to anyone and anything that thinks and processes information in the same idiosyncratic way that we do. In addition, we think of ourselves as static, fixed beings, whereas in fact we are more like shifting clouds. Nearly a century ago, Hermann Ebbinghaus showed conclusively that people forget 80% of the information they experience within a month. We are not the same person we were as a kid. We are not the same person before and after our education, travel, or military experience. Our very identity is by its very nature a shapeshifter. As mentioned earlier, it will be the job of our L5 trustees and trust protectors to ensure using psychometric tools that we awake as mind clones as the same person we were when we took our last heartbeat. But being the same person doesn't mean having the same identical memories, thoughts, and motivations. We don't even have those from one day to the next. Instead, being the same person means an expert who has assessed the totality of your mind file, including video interviews, and who then carried out hours of conversations with your mind clone, would come to the conclusion that your mind clone and your original self were one and the same consciousness. That there is a core sense of self, some people would call it the soul, and that there was a continuity of mannerisms, personality, recollections, feelings, beliefs, attitudes, and values. I like the Persian proverb that the best memory is one which forgets nothing but injuries, write kindness in marble, write injuries in dust. Some people worry that it won't be fun to wake up like Rip Van Winkle with the entire world changed around you and all your best friends gone. But I don't think it'll be anything like that. First, we hope to have many, if not most of our friends joining us on L5 fulfilling our dream to live out our lives on an O'Neill settlement in space. Second, unlike Rip Van Winkle, we will be part of a constant process of synchronizing our mind files and mind clones with modernity. As our mind clones are awakened, we will be gently reminded of our consent to the process and of the changes in the world that have happened. Once our mind clone is awakened, we will be active participants in modernity, up to and through the point that our mind clones are instantiated in a regenerated body and our regenerated body is living in an L5 condo. Some people insist that the mind clone cannot logically be the original person and is at best a descendant of the original person. I don't really think this changes anything because having one's descendants living in space would certainly be a victory and all the more so if the descendant was scarcely differentiable from ourself. A person awakening as a mind clone will know that they are not living in their original body and will be sad about that, but they will also know that they will have funded a trust that will get them a new body and a condo on L5. They will also know that they can finally catch up on their piles of books and magazines to read and do useful design and development work for L5. I think that it will be tremendously exciting for them whether they think of themselves as self 1.0 or self 2.0. In summary, with respect to the me or my mind clone question, it is at once a subjective question, a legal question, and a cognitive science question. Just like agitation over civil rights for various demographic groups, from women to slaves, to LGBTQ people, all people that the power structure claimed had diminished capacity, but for all of whom ultimately we achieved some level of legal equality, I think it is likely that cyberphobia will give way to legal rights for mind clones. 
It may very well be that compromises result in only economic rights for mine clones on Earth, without voting or family rights, but that L5 space settlements will be looked at as the one place mine clones can enjoy full legal and social equality. You will know if your mine clone is you. Your family and your loved ones will know and will care. Even if the first version doesn't cut it, there will be unrelenting decades of industry-wide work on mindware, making it increasingly likely, and in fact inevitable, that a consented mind file will awaken sooner or later as a healthy, happy, human mind clone. So let's now conclude by laying out all the cards on the table. The way to get to an L5 space settlement in your lifetime is to join the group of spacer beneficiaries in the lower right-hand corner who are contributing $3 a day to an L5 trust. That trust will specify an institutional trustee to effectuate the intent of the beneficiaries and an institutional trust protector to further effectuate the intent of the beneficiaries, including monitoring the trustee itself. The trust will allocate just under half of the trust assets to purchase a condo in L5 and just under half of the trust assets to regenerate a body for L5, with the balance going to maintaining the beneficiary's mind in a mind file, activating that mind file with certified mindware, and obtaining an independent, meaningful, and healthy virtual life for the resulting mind clone until such time that their body and condo on L5 are ready. Trustees ordinarily earn a fee of about 1% of the assets they manage, while trust protectors usually earn an hourly fee for the work they actually do. Based on this solution, I think there are generally four outcomes possible. Either you create or don't create a trust, and either the two hypotheses do or don't come true. If you choose the upper right-hand corner, you win a jackpot and also avoid the left-hand top corner tragedy of missing out on L5 for want of $3 a day. If the hypotheses don't come true, either you're out $3 a day or you save $3 a day. Either way, unless $3 a day is important to your well-being, and I understand that for millions and millions of people it is, the most rational decision is the upper right-hand corner. In conclusion, I told you I'd describe how we can get to L5 in our lifetimes. I've shown that L5 housing is likely affordable and that there is no doubt indicia of consciousness can be stored. I've shown that it is likely trends will enable digital consciousness and make affordable regenerated bodies and even mate digital consciousness with those bodies. It is an open question as to whether or not your digital consciousness will be recognized as yourself but even if it is like an offspring of yourself, I think that is still pretty cool. Finally, there are existing trust law tools to handle the logistics of getting us, and I mean specifically us, from here on Earth to an L5 space settlement. That's turning a moonshot into an Earthshot. Thank you.